This is 12 Hours in the Future with Maria Sincher. My guest is singer, songwriter, educator, composer, and associate professor at Senior College at City University of New York, Lehman College, Professor Michael Bacon. Professor Bacon has many credits to his name in film scoring. He won Emmy Award for his work in PBS production of the Kennedy's docuseries. He is also one half of music band The Bacon Brothers with his brother, actor Kevin Bacon. We had a virtual conversation, Professor Bacon from his home in the hills of Pennsylvania and me from my home in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Welcome, Professor. Good morning to you. It is an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Likewise, and good morning to you. And uh, actually, I know it's good evening for you, but um, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, nothing I like better than to talk about music in all of its facets. Thank you so much. My first question would be related to pandemic uh, and the lockdowns. Many people are saying that they are developing new skills and hobbies. I was wondering if you have as well. Yeah, um, a couple of things. Uh, with my band, um, normally during the summer we're on tour for 40 or 50 dates a year, which is our time. This is the Bacon Brothers with my brother Kevin. Um, it's a six-piece band, nine people tour with us. Uh, and normally we would, in the summers we would be out for 40 or 50 dates. So um, last summer everything was canceled, of course. So we did a lot of uh, projects to try to keep the band in the public eye and also things that we did for public service. Um, we did a couple of videos on, uh, I think when the, the COVID-19 crisis first hit, um, people were being encouraged to stay home. So we took an old Rolling Stone song called I'm um, going home, and I adapted it. We're we're staying home, but that kind of thing. And we did a a uh, all the guys in the band. We made it look like a Zoom video, but as you know, you can't really play together as a band in remote locations because of the the um, uh, the delay. So um, that was fun, and um, I was very lucky. My wife and I are very lucky in that six months before the COVID hit, we decided to take a year off from New York and sublet our apartment and move to this house in Pennsylvania, which is where I am now. And when the COVID hit, we just stayed. So we really uh, didn't have um, any kind of a negative fallout or very little negative fallout because we're, we're in the middle of the country, very, very, very isolated. Um, other things, um, I've been doing a lot of um, Physical things that I never did before, um, taking uh, classes at the YMCA on, on yoga and Pilates and dance movement and stuff, wow, which is um, how great. Yeah, it's a real critical thing, and I, in fact, I um, I'm trying to set up a new program at Lehman in um, uh, digital technology, music technology, and this would be a new track or major which would go alongside of the current more, conserv more traditional uh, conservatory training. And one of the things I would love to see is have students study Alexander Technique and uh, body movement and those kinds of things because um, to me it's critical if you're going to be a musician that no doors are ever closed because you don't know when the phone rings, who's going to be on the other end of the phone? And if someone wants you to be join their band, and all of a sudden you're on stage and you've never, you have no body movement. When people come to a concert, I'm not saying they want to see people dancing and stuff, but they want to see people who are very comfortable in their bodies on stage. They want to see something that they don't have. And... Um, Body movement would be one of those aspects, along with musicianship and um, and great rhythm and intonation and flair and creativity and all those other things. To me, as a college professor, what I'm trying to do is is give the students everything they might need when they matriculate out into the real world. Um, 
so it's been it's been something I've I've really not done my whole career. I've always worked on singing and playing and and performance skills, but not feeling you know comfortable in body movement. So when I'm on the stage, um, I'm next to one of the great natural dancers I've ever seen. My brother is an incredible dancer, uh, and he doesn't. He was born with that, and I wasn't. I just didn't have that. So I'm feeling like, I mean, I, we haven't been on stage since I've started this program, but I'm feeling that maybe I'll feel a little more comfortable with it. Right. And, um, if I am, that would be an achievement that I could only um, uh, put at the feet of the uh, being in the pandemic and having time and being in one place to, to put my time into that. I want to say that I really enjoy the beauty of the bigger Bigger, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, the, you know, the video is amazing and the music. It's funny you, you, you bring that up because um, Bigger is a song my brother wrote and he did this video, which they, it's called Stop, Stop Motion. Stop Motion, yeah. Stop Motion, yes, okay. Yeah. Um, and one of my oldest clients saw the video and he called me up. He said, wow, that was amazing. Who did your brother get to do that? Yeah. And I said, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I assumed that that wouldn't be something that a uh, untrained, well, not that my brother's not trained. I mean, as, as a director, he's trained, but not in technical. Right. Way. And so I asked him and he said that he did the whole thing himself. Mm -hmm. And there is an app for an iPhone. You guys probably knew this. I didn't, I don't know anything about video that you can set to do stop action and you can set how much time between each one of the moves and you can discard the moves that maybe your finger got in it, um, change the spacing afterwards. And I think it's, maybe it's not free, but it's very, very cheap. So just for those who haven't seen it, the, the song is called Bigger and the um, what happens is my brother when he was a little kid, had all G.I. Joes. Do you know what G.I. Joes are, Maria? Yes. Okay. The toys, yeah, <laughs> right. like they're soldier little, toys. They're wonderful little toys, and he had, and my mother helped to make lots of different costumes. So they were kind of G.I. Joe bodies with all this cool stuff, you know, hippie clothes and and uh, Mexican serapes and uh, and you remember those sandals with the with the car tires on the bottom. So he had all these little <laughs> things, and they were down in his basement. So he got the idea of taking this song and doing a stop action animation. And I couldn't be there. Uh, he was up in his house in Connecticut, so he pasted a picture of my face on one yeah, of the your face on one of them. Yeah. So you'll see I'm not really featured in the video, but I am actually there. And it, it's an absolutely terrific video. And it's kind of a great example of how you can use ingenuity and the incredible explosion of amazing technology that would have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably 10 or 15 years ago. And now you can be in your house in quarantine and do amazing creative creative things that potentially could go viral um, and could change your life. Yeah, I really like the idea. It was an amazing idea to overcome this whole uh, lockdown thing and just accommodate your needs for the video. It was amazing. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Now, I wanted to continue and ask about education, Professor. As far as I know, uh, the music education in the United States and the one that I've been through here in Mongolia differ a lot. So I wanted to ask if you could take us to a journey of your musical education as a child and what was your experience? Just maybe share some memories. Great question. I mean, um, in, a, in a funny way, that's probably my favorite question because it allows me to talk about what an amazing childhood I have, and also talk about the fact that the assets that a child growing up in the public schools in Philadelphia had when I was growing up is not there anymore. And that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, so just to my, my particular situation, um, my parents were not musicians, um, but 
very creatively motivated. Um, my mother was a identical twin uh, Park Avenue debutante who rejected the upper class of New York City for a totally different life. You know, I guess you would probably, you know, in, when I was growing we would call that dropping out maybe. Um, so she and my father, uh, my father was a, trained as an architect and a city planner, uh, were what I would describe as urban pioneers going into the inner city of Philadelphia, buying a funky old house, fixing it up, and raising six children in the mean streets of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia back then, this is late 40s when I was born, was not an easy city to be a child in. Um, so our house was kind of, in a funny way, it was like the Athenian dream of music lessons, acting lessons, dancing lessons, sewing lessons, art lessons. That's all my parents cared about. And they were both full-time, they both had full-time jobs and were super busy. My father being the city planner of Philadelphia and my mother was an early childhood specialist. And my father being an architect redesigned this funny little house in the middle of Philadelphia so that the first floor in the kitchen above the stove and what we called then the ice box, mm -hmm. there was a, um, a soffit. And in that soffit was an 18 inch Jensen speaker and an Altec Lansing horn. So in a funny way, the kitchen, the entire kitchen was a speaker. And you halfway between there was kind of a bookcase and in there were Marantz and Macintosh amplifiers and you know all the best gear you could get in those days in the 50s and then when you went all the way into the living room which was near the front door uh, you would sit down and there was a control center uh, volume bass treble switching between radio phonograph whatever else they had uh, I guess that was it, radio and phonograph. There really wasn't any other alternative in those days. So when I would be upstairs falling asleep at, let's say, 8.30 or 9, my parents, after working like crazy all day, their, their relaxation was to have a glass of sherry and turn on the FM radio or put on a Weaver's album or Philadelphia Orchestra or um, Olatunje or Mississippi John Hurt, um, or um, Charlie Parker. So this incredible, beautiful, which I don't even think you could get sound like this today. I don't think people are used to it. It was all mono, so that's the first thing. And it would waft upstairs where I was sleeping, and I would, you know, in, in the early parts of my sleep, I would spend, you know, an hour, an hour and a half hearing the greatest music in the world. Um, so... I attribute my ability as a composer to access, I, I call it a spigot. When I have to compose for a film, I just turn this thing on and it, all that background that I had as a child is right there, totally accessible to me until I want to turn it off. Um, so getting back to the education part I had, I started playing the cello when I was six or seven then later, maybe nine or ten, my sister taught me how to play the guitar and all the fretted instruments, banjos, mandolins, uh, auto harps, ukuleles, all that kind of stuff. And then in high school, um, I, I switched to the oboe because I, I got really tired of being in the cello section. I wasn't particularly, I wasn't the, the, the first cellist. I was usually kind of in the middle. You know, it's a very, very competitive situation and I'm, I'm sure it is in Mongolia as well. Um, so playing the oboe, but I had no actual training in composition or theory or music history or anything, really. I just, it was all performance oriented. But going back to what is not there anymore, when I was growing up, every student from about, I would think, fourth grade could opt to get an instrument for free mm -hmm. and a teacher for free and the opportunity to play in an orchestra. So my first experience in orchestra was being, I was the first cellist. Actually, I was 
competitive when I was really young because I had my parents, I have really, really good teachers, not the public school teachers and really good instruments. So I became the, I auditioned for the All Philadelphia Elementary School Orchestra and they made me the, the first cellist and I was, because I had nothing to compare it with. Um, but in that orchestra, there were some wonderful players who all were given free lessons, free instruments, and opportunity to play not only in the off if you were good enough to play in the off Philadelphia Orchestra, if you weren't good enough, you could play in your elementary school. They all had orchestras as well. And the same thing, it, you, go, you go to junior high school, and then there's an all Philadelphia junior high school orchestra. There is the all Philadelphia senior high school orchestra. And at that point, there were some seriously amazing players. And one of my favorite memories is um, we were doing the arrangement of Bach's Pasakalian Fugue, um, arranged by Leopold Stokowski, who was a conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra at the time. And people probably know him as the white-haired fellow in, in uh, Fantasia, Walt Disney Fantasia. Um, and he came out to our rehearsal on Tuesday night while we were rehearsing Pascal and Fugue and conducted us and gave us, you know, a rehearsal with him, the guy that arranged it, plus really pretty much the premier conductor in the whole world. You know, wow. if you get the the Pascal, they start da, da. let me see if I can play. I probably get the key wrong, but I know that we're Well, anyway, that's the, I played in the wrong key, but it ends on a low C string. So I should have done a third up. So one of the problems, as you know, with stringed instruments is when you have to play an open string, there's not a lot of expression you can put into it. So he said, okay, cellists, when you go to that, and take your finger and put it on the other side of the nut and vibrate there. So instead of, you get a tiny, <laughs> tiny bit, which means that all the overtones generated by this are really kind of flat. All the overtones generated by this are totally different. And, um, you know, that's just something I just never forgot. Um, and I guess that's a long way of saying that when I was growing up and if you were a public school kid in Philadelphia, you had uh, resources to all music and you were only limited by your desire to practice and, and your natural talent. So, uh, a great memory. Thank you, Professor, for sharing this amazingly inspiring story with us. It's funny that I think my favorite compositional style is Pascalia, which means, for those who don't know, it's a repeating lower bass line. Right. That never changes, and the upper voices build on that and relate to it in many, many different ways, and it can get very, very complex, but the bass line is always right. the same. Um, in fact, Paco Bell's canon that everybody knows is actually not a canon, it's a, it's a um, Pascalia. Um, so I, I'm just drawn to that, and maybe that experience is a 13-year-old, 14-year-old in Philadelphia in a high school orchestra, maybe that's the reason. So I think it's, um, it's, it's too bad that, that we don't have that anymore because I'm 100%, and I think most of the fairly recent um, scientific discoveries have been that music at a very, very young age, maybe even prenatal, is critical. It makes your brain develop, you know, we know we have two sides of the brains and they do certain things. I don't know what they do. But they do something different. Whereas music integrates both sides. That's my understanding. And um, unfortunately, when we get to be adults, we lose that sponge-like ability to just pull. And um, when I was, by the time I was 11 or 12, I mean, I was just, you know, a, 
I just sponged up so much music, rock and pop and classical and jazz and folk and uh, all the fret instruments, all, you know, the cello, all the stringed instruments, the oboe. Um, but I really didn't have any technical training in music besides performance. So um, when I dropped out of college uh, in the late 60s, I joined a friend of mine in a, in a band and um, it was just a duet. And he was he played cello and electric bass. I didn't play cello with him at that time. I played guitar and I was the lead singer. We had two-part harmony. And we were signed by Columbia Records almost immediately. And it set me off on a path of pop music, um, which in a funny way still is going on since I'm still in a rock pop band. Um, didn't really expect to be at this age, but here I am. Um, so... I pursued that. I became a staff writer in Nashville, Tennessee, songwriter, a professional songwriter. I was being paid to write songs. Um, and uh, eventually I came back up to the East Coast and was performing in colleges and high schools. And um, then the disco era hit and my kind of James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, Jim Croce kind of vibe was just wasn't happening anymore so um uh i also had a child at that point and uh, my wife was basically supporting our family she was a teacher um she got a degree in teaching in in nashville um and i decided it was really time to change career paths and we moved to new york and i thought i would be writing and singing jingles because i'm a singer songwriter and the oboe and the the quote unquote classical area area of my background really didn't apply to anything um and i found out that i really wasn't a good jingle writer there's lots of different kinds of talents that people have and writing a 15 second piece that everybody's gonna like is not one of mine um so um People had asked me, knowing I was a songwriter, to um, write songs for their films they were doing, and I was good at that because it was a little bit more long form than a jingle and had a lot more depth. And um, so that seemed to be kind of going, and I started realizing, you know, I don't really have any training in orchestration or theory or any. I just strictly knew how to play the cello and all the banjos and the oboe, but I didn't really know anything other than that. So. I started uh, taking courses. I took one amazing course with a guy named Don Sebesky, who's a jazz legend. But he had this course that lasted a whole year. He would go one day a week for six hours. And he taught me all the technical, um, practical aspects. Of, for instance, if you can, uh, if you can only afford, uh, if you if you only can afford to have four brass and well, let's say sax and brass three i mean put them in force and it'll the ear will kind of make up the fact that you don't have five-part harmony all sorts of stuff like that how do you if you can only afford five strings how to get what three violins four violins one cello and if you can afford seven strings and this and then nine strings and it was all very very practical for working musicians and it was wonderful and i started taking some private lessons and uh, one day, um, and my film scoring career was going really well. I was really busy. I had a studio at, in Midtown. And one day I was reading the local 802 Musicians Union paper. And um, I saw Lehman College uh, study with John Corleano. Um, and I checked the price and I think... It was five thousand dollars a year, something like, or maybe it was thirty-five. It was it was cheap, and John Corleano was one of my idols. Um, and if those of you who don't know about John's career, he's probably the definitely the, one in the top ten of living composers. Uh, he scored Red Violin, right? Red Violin Academy Award winning Red Violin score. Yeah, not just a you know a, um, a composer nerd, also very very strong in popular culture. Also, a, a um, Academy Award nominee f nominee for Altered States, which was a groundbreaking score. 
Um, and I jumped at the chance and uh, I had, as I said, my career was doing really well. I was full time and full time as a film composer is a lot more than eight hours a day. It's it's a unfortunately a very time intensive uh, career. And uh, so I said, I'm going to go for it. And I became a full time student at Lehman and kept my other um, career going as well. And with a lot of support from my family, I might add, uh, my wife and I at this point were working together so she could kind of compensate for the hours that I wasn't in the studio. And um, I spent two years at Lehman, um, studying with John uh, orchestration and 20th century film, com 20th century composition, and also a private lesson once a week. Uh, and there were also some other amazing, um, there was a professor um, of history, and I was really weak in history. Nobody ever taught me any music history. I was never a music major. Um, um, Professor Kravitz uh, did the cycle of Baroque, classical, romantic, 20th century. And uh, if you're a film composer and you can at least talk with some confidence about the difference between classical music and romantic music, for a client, you're going to be at a huge disadvantage. And I, until I came to Lima, I couldn't do that. And I also obviously, you know, studied with the, one of the greatest orchestrators ever, uh, John Corleano. And we had this wonderful guy named um, Professor Costanescu. And this is in the 90s. And he taught us whatever he wanted to, including going into the, the Lehman um uh, synthesizer lab and there's a gigantic Moog synthesizer from the 70s which um, I actually rediscovered and absconded with and is now in the um, in the recording studio and where our plans are to fix it up and and demonstrate this behemoth I mean it's gigantic and it's all anyway so a um, uh, long way of saying that my education was unusual it was much more performance-based than um, music history, music theory-based, but uh, I was able to catch up with those things at very, you know, at a later time in life. And Lehman College was the vehicle for which I was able to do that. So that um, being a film composer, I it gave me a lot more confidence in terms of working with my clients. Which film composing is all about working with clients. That's all it is getting work, doing the work satisfactorily, trying to get more work with someone else. What happens in film co composing is everybody's freelance, the editor, director, producer, assistant editor, they do the job with you and then they all go out for different jobs. And if they're calling you and introducing you to the new thing, then that's that's the whole way it works. Um, so in terms of my um, philosophy of what I want to do as a professor at Lehman College and also Manus College is I come from not an academic background. I come from sort of the other side, which was figure out how to get, first of all, get to work, figure out how to do it, and then figure out what you need to supplement that. So I have a pretty good sense of what kinds of skills um, students need when they graduate from college to go out and at least have a chance of getting work in the real world so that if the phone rings and it's something different than you ever expected, you can at least say, yeah, I can do that. And maybe you don't have complete information, but you have incomplete information, but enough to give you confidence that you can figure it out. And to me, that's sort of the crux of what education should be. And if someone is coming to a college that I'm teaching, at which I'm teaching, I feel really compelled to give them those skills so that when that phone rings and well, actually the first, just another personal story, the first job I ever got in New York and I was in New York with a three-year-old kid in a tiny apartment for two years. I couldn't even get a meeting and I had good stuff. I had a good reel. I'd done a lot of, you know, orchestral stuff and, um, and one day the phone rang and it was, a friend of mine's girlfriend who was working in an office of a film producer who was doing a project 
for which the composer he had hired, he fired him. And it was, you needed to be able to write songs, produce and orchestrate. So you couldn't just be a producer or an orchestrator or a composer. You had to be a songwriter too. And I was those things. And I played the guy a couple of my songs and a couple of my orchestrations. And he took a chance on me, hired me on the spot. And next week I'm finishing up another film for him. It's probably the 50th project we've done together. Uh, and we're talking about early 1980s. That's how long ago that one moment that the phone rang that I could go and say, yeah, I can do that. Even though I, there were a lot of things. First of all, this was a time where they were shooting in film, editing and video. It was a disastrous time because film runs at one speed, video runs at another. The technology was horrible for synchronization at that point. And he said, well, I want to meet you again in 24 hours. You have to tell me that you you have a method for how you're going to pull this off. And I don't want to go to the details, but it was really hard. It was the synchronization levels were crazy. And I made some calls and talked to some people and they gave me some advice. And the next day I went in and I said, yeah, I can do this. So that's what I'm trying to. That is great. That's for my students. Uh, that's all I care about. What What can I you're spending your good money and a lot of your time. What can I do to make you ready to enjoy a life of music? Because enjoying a life of, as being a musician is, to me, the greatest thing in the world. But it's not an easy thing to do. Right. Yeah, thank you, Professor. This is an amazing conversation. This concludes the first part of our conversation with singer-songwriter, educator, composer, and associate professor at Senior College of City University of New York, Lehman College, Michael Bacon. 12 Hours in the Future is produced by Jim Carney, Maria Sanchir, and we had technical help from Eve Dussou. Special thanks to Professor Tom O'Hanlon and Dean James Mann. The executive producer and host of 12 Hours in the Future is Maria Sanchir. 12 Hours in the Future with Maria Sanchir is a series of conversations recorded simultaneously in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and around the world by the Bronx Journal Radio through the resources of Lehman College, City University of New York. You can reach us at info at 12hoursinthefuture.com or on Instagram and YouTube or you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. This show is protected under international copyright and may not be recorded or retransmitted without written consent. Until next time, when we see you 12 hours in the future.